in this third installment, so to speak, of our journey to the cross. I've entitled this sermon, Trouble in the Temple. Now we need to understand this isn't trouble for Jesus, the trouble for the leaders that he's speaking to. We're considering these events after Jesus entered the city in what we call the triumphal entry, when he was presenting himself as Messiah and King. That is what happened on what we call Palm Sunday. It was the Sunday before the Sunday of the Resurrection. There are many things that happened in that last week, and literally dozens of chapters are devoted to describing those events and the teachings of Jesus during those few days before the crucifixion. This morning I want to focus on the events that happened on Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week. We recall that Jesus was in Bethany on Saturday night. There was a banquet that was given to him. Mary anointed Jesus with a very costly uh, perfume, preparing him for his burial. The next Sunday, probably later in the day, the afternoon certainly, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, thus signifying that he was the Messiah, he was the king that was coming. After arriving in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, we find in Mark 11 that Jesus visited the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. We remember that that western gate led directly to the temple grounds. It was the only gate in Jerusalem that did that. It was a very short distance from the Golden Gate, as it's called, because it glows in the afternoon when the afternoon sun hits it, and it's a direct way into the temple. It's difficult to, to uh, place all the events of that last week in uh, with absolute certainty. There's so many chapters, so many things that happen. There are a lot of parables. There's a lot of teachings. Each of the gospel writers had their own unique approach, and they presented it in a little different way. We can place the things done and said only with reasonable certainty. We know they all happened during that week, but as far as exactly the day and, and the time as to when they happened, we can't be completely certain. But what we can observe with certainty is that Jesus is no longer avoiding confrontation with the leaders. His actions and teachings are very well calculated. They're calculated to, to reveal the sinful and evil parts of the Jewish leaders. He confronted each one of three groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Herodians. And these three compro comprised the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish council. He confronted each one of these groups. The crowds were very fascinated by this because these leaders had very little status in the average Jewish person. They recognized that they were not uh, good people. They had very little love or respect for those leaders. They followed them because they had to, but they didn't do it willingly. Most of these confrontations happened within the temple grounds. It'll add to our understanding if we take a moment just to picture the temple of the New Testament. This was what's called Herod's temple. It was actually the third temple that was built on the same site, the first being built by Solomon. The second, and that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then when the Jewish people came back from Babylon, under Darius the Persian, they rebuilt the temple. But it was not anywhere near as 
as beautiful or as extravagant as what Solomon could do. But then Herod, when he came into power about 40 BC, he wanted to win the approval of the Jewish people and, and he had enough resources. He doubled the size of the temple grounds and he remodeled the temple itself. Therefore, we call it the third temple, although it was actually just a remodel of the second one and an expansion. This construction of this temple began about 20 BC. It was a project of Herod, and Herod is called Herod the Great. Herod was never able to shed the identity of being an outsider. He really wasn't Jewish, he was an Edomite. We remember Edom were the descendants of Esau. And they originally lived to the southeast of the Dead Sea, but they had been displaced by the Babylonians that settled in the southern part of Israel. And Herod had been installed as king by the Romans. He wasn't elected, he was appointed by the Romans about 40 BC. The main temple building itself was completed relatively quickly, although the construction of other buildings in the area continued for many years. John, John 2, 20 quotes the Jews as saying the temple had taken 46 years to build. Actual embellishments of the temple grounds continued until 64 AD, just a, a few years before the Romans came in and leveled Jerusalem and the temple and everything else. It was said of this temple, if you had not observed Herod's temple, you had never seen a beautiful building. Apparently, it was quite extravagant. The temple area itself consisted of several concentric and terraced courts. The temple itself was at the highest point, and then the other courts kind of came down a little bit, and each one was a little bit higher than the others. The outside court, the biggest court, was called the Court of the Gentiles. It was surrounded by a covered portico, or a kind of a porch with columns that supported it. It was under this portico that Jesus did most of his teaching. It was called Solomon's Portico. The schools of the rabbis also met under, these, under this area. Inside the court of the Gentiles were two other courts. They were kind of uh, both comprised a single court, but they were divided. You had the court of the women and the court of the men. And these were for Jewish people only. In fact, if a Gentile went into that court, it was after penalty of death. Inside this court, was the court of the priests. And this is where the altar was, where the sacrifices were made. And then at the highest point was the temple itself. And the temple itself comprised was comprised of two chambers. The first chamber was the holy place, and that was where the table of incense, the candlesticks, the table of shoe bread was there. And then the inner part was the Holy of Holies. In the tabernacle, the original tabernacle, and these two were, were separated by a very thick curtain. In the original tabernacle that was constructed in the wilderness and also in Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant contained the two tablets where the Ten Commandments were written, the tablets that God inscribed on the mountain of Sinai. On top of the ark was a covering, a golden lid, so to speak, which was called the mercy seat. And it had two cherubim that were on either end of it that kind of extended up, and God's Shekinah glory dwelt on top of that. It was on the mercy seat that the blood, once a year, 
was poured out. The blood of atonement. But as Judah lapsed into gross idolatry, the temple became polluted with idols. They actually had idols that they would put and erect inside the holy place. The prophet Ezekiel describes the inside of the temple in Ezekiel chapter 9. If you want to turn there, or if you just want to listen to these, these words, it is kind of an amazing thing that was happening there. In Ezekiel 9, verses 8 through 13, it tells about a vision that God gave to Ezekiel. It says, then he brought me to the entrance of the court, and then I looked, behold, a hole in the wall, a hole in the wall of the temple. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing there. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. And standing in front of them were seventy elders of the house of Israel. And they were all had their censers, and they were waving and offering incense to these. Just previous to the Babylonian invasion, because of this repeated desecration of the temple, the Shekinah glory of God departed from the temple. Ezekiel 10 and 11 describe this very sad scene. It talks about how the glory left in stages. Verse 4 of chapter 10 says, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with a cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And then 18 and 19 says, And the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim, and then the cherubim departed. They lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with wheels beside them, and they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. So it, it, the glory of the Lord went to the threshold of the temple and then to the wall, the eastern gate of the temple grounds. And then 11, verse 23 says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain which was east of the city, the Mount of Olives. It's very interesting that when the Lord Jesus returns, he will come back to the Mount of Olives. It says his foot will step down on the Mount of Olives and it will be split. And then he'll proceed in through the eastern gate, which right now is closed up. God's glory was no longer in the temple. When the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple in 586 B.C., the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. Speculation has it that the priest removed it before the temple destruction, but nobody really knows what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. I suppose it still could exist, although I doubt it, but its discovery would certainly spur on the rebuilding of the temple. There is a temple that does exist during the tribulation period. In the temple built by those returning from the Babylonian exile, the Holy of Holies was basically a bare room. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no mercy seat. There was no Shekinah glory of God because it never returned. Where the ark would have, stone, would have stood, there was only a raised platform. And the blood of the yearly atonement was poured out on that raised platform. God's Shekinah glory never returned either to the temple of Ezra and Nehemiah, nor 
to Herod's temple. In Herod's temple, a bare rock was exposed in the Holy of Holies. And it was on this rock that the blood was applied and the prayer offered by the high priest for the people. Now, all this background explains one very important thing. It explains how the high priests, who were appointed by the Romans, were of the sect of the irreligious Sadducees, how they could enter the Holy of Holies without being killed. You remember the high priest had special garments. It talks about those in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and they had bells on the on the uh, edges of their robe, so that if that that they would make a tinkling sound, and the priests that were waiting outside the holy of holies, when when the priest went, high priest went in once a year. If he went in with sin, without having atoned for his own sin first, he would die. And they would know by the silence of the bells. But the high priest during the time of Jesus and the time of Herod's temple, they weren't even believing people. They were political appointees. But they could go in and do their job which was just for show. That explains why they didn't die for defining the holiness of God in the Holy of Holies. The temple, magnificent as it was, was a little more than a symbol. Although it did have value as a place of worship, and Jesus called it, and Jesus called it my house. It was a place of worship for the righteous, a place of prayer for all people. And it was here that Jesus entered on Monday morning and cast out the merchants and the money changers. What was the significance of Jesus' actions that Monday morning? I'll read about those actions in Matthew chapter 21. It's told about in all the Gospels, but... Matthew 21 is one of the most descriptive. Verses 12 to 17, where we'll begin reading. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. Note that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he also did the same thing. He also drove the, the money changers and the merchants out of the temple. We read about that in John chapter 2. And it's very much the very same thing. In both of these instances, the merchants and the money changers had set up their businesses in the court of the Gentiles, rendering it unsuitable for any semblance of quiet worship and prayer. We can see the heart of God in that he established a court for the Gentiles, where Gentiles could come and they could learn about the Lord and learn about the God of Israel. It was also in the outfit Side or the or the porticos that surrounded the court of the Gentiles said teaching, where Jesus could do his teaching, where the Pharisees could have their their uh, classes there. But can you imagine the smell? Could you imagine the the turmoil and things? It, it made it impossible for quiet worship which was the purpose of the court of the Gentiles. The required changing of money from the very currencies around the Roman Empire, and there were people that came at these festivals and, and at different times to worship at the temple. They would come from different places, but because the coinage had pictures of men on them, and they were 
rendered or they were considered to be profane. And you couldn't pay the temple tax for every Jew. Every Jew was owed, owed a temple tax. You could not pay that with a Roman coin. You could not pay that with a Phoenician coin. You couldn't pay that with a Syrian coin. It had to be exchanged for the temple currency. And if your coin was worth more than the, than the currency that was required, they charged you an extra charge for that. It was kind of a racket. <laughs> the whole money changing process was designed to defraud the worshiper and enrich the money changer and his superiors. But here's one fact that's kind of fascinating. The Talmud was writings that was talking about all the things that happened during that time. The Talmud gives us a very important fact that figures largely into the opposition of the chief priest to Jesus. The whole business operation of the temple grounds belonged to the family of Annas, the high priest. When Jesus upsets the merchants, chasing them out of the court of the Gentiles, he was depriving the chief priests of revenue. He was hitting them right in their wallets. And this largely explains the opposition of the Sadducees, who were the ruling aristocratic class of Israel and Jerusalem. One more word of explanation about these high priests. They were appointed by the Romans, no longer holding the, the official office for life, which was what God's standard was for the high priest. They were the high priest for their life. Until they died, then, there, then it was an inherited sort of thing. They served, these high priests served at the discretion and pleasure of the Roman government. And the high priest of this period was called, was named Caiaphas. Caiaphas held the office from 18 to 36 AD. He had succeeded his father-in-law, who was named Annas. The chief priests spoken of in the gospel were Annas and Caiaphas and other family members of Annas. Annas had five sons who also each served as high priests. Josephus, the Jewish historian, noticed, noted these things about Annas. He said he was a great hoarder of, of money, very rich, and as is spoiling by open violence the common priests of their official revenues. By casting out those selling in the temple court of the Gentiles, along with the money changers, Jesus was implying that the high priests were thieves and robbers. But the Sadducees weren't the only ones that Jesus confronted during these days. Jesus continued to teach and to heal the sick on Monday and Tuesday. Note the words of Matthew 21, 14, and 15. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Actually, they came to the door of the temple, or the gates of the temple, because the blind and the, blame, the, the, blind and the lame were not allowed in the temple. And he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosea to the son of David, they became indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never heard or read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you prepared praise for yourself? The response of the chief priests and the scribes, now remember the scribes were also called lawyers, and they were of the sect of the Pharisees. The response to miracles of healing, they became indignant. Instead of rejoicing that, that, they, that the, the blind and the lame were being healed, they became indignant and said, get out of here. Jesus' parables during these days directly accused the, the Jewish leaders. But further, at verse 28 to 32, 
verse 28, says, Jesus is giving a parable. He says, what do you think? The man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And the man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, didn't even feel remorse afterwards, so to believe him. That was to the Pharisees. You can imagine the response to Jesus' words in verse 31. 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. Remember who Jesus is teaching here, or preaching to the Pharisees. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to the vine growers, and went on a journey. And when the harvest came approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. And he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. They did the same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his son, saying, They'll respect my son. And when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they said, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched inn and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds of the proper seasons. And Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. And this came about from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and on whoever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood it. He was speaking about them. And they, when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus didn't mince words with the Pharisees. We learn exactly what God thinks of religious hypocrisy. Follow along in Matthew 23 as Jesus describes their evil behavior which was hidden behind the things that God was saying. Note how this might mimic some religious practices today. In chapter 23, Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. Going on to verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut out the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' or houses. For a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. When he comes one, you make him twice a son of hell as yourselves. And he goes on. Woe to you. Woe to you. Jesus wasn't retreating. He wasn't fading away into the crowds. This was up front. 
in your face before the people, as the people were listening, Jesus was condemning these people, the leaders. Another challenge was raised by the third group of Jews, first the Sadducees, then the Pharisees, and now the Herodians. The political party, these were ones who supported Herod and what he was doing. Matthew 22, 15 reveals a plot to trap Jesus. This was the plot where they asked him about the woman who had seven husbands, who were all brothers, starting in verse 15. The Pharisees went up and fought together how they might trap him, and they sent their disciples along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know you're truthful, and teach the way of God in truth, and defer to no one, you're not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar? Or not? But Jesus received, perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin used in the poll tax. And they gave him a denarius. And he said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And he said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and to God the things which are God's. And hearing this, they were, away. They were amazed. And leaving him, they went away. Then we come to the Sadducees in verse 23. And they said, Teacher Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother is next of kin, shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us. The first married, the first married and died. Having no children, he left his wife to his brother. And so also the second, the third, down to the seventh, last of all, the women died. The woman died. In the resurrection. And you have to realize that the, that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. In fact, some people said that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> but in the resurrection they asked, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. And Jesus answered said to him, you are mistaken, not understanding the scripture, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither married or given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. I know that raises more questions than I really want to answer right now. Mainly because I don't quite understand it. My wife says it's fine to say I don't know. <laughs> In addition to challenging and confronting each of the leading groups of the Jewish leadership, Jesus talked very extensively during these two days to the crowds and to his followers. He told of the future period of tribulation and his second coming in what we call the Olivet Discourse. You find that in Matthew 24. He encouraged all of us to be prepared for his return, for only the Father knows when that day will be. During all these times, all of these confrontations, Jesus was setting the stage for his arrest and trials and crucifixion. He deliberately, publicly condemned the Jewish leaders. But many were attracted by the truth of his message and his teaching with authority. I believe that many who heard Jesus on this day stayed around until the day of Pentecost. And there were of the 6,000 that believed on the day of Pentecost, almost two months later. Jesus had a purpose. He chose the time of his death. His disciples were still believing and holding hope that, that as they watched these confrontations, Jesus at any moment was going to openly announce, I'm going to take the throne of David. This explains their shock and extreme surprise when Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was put to death. 
They didn't understand the Messiah had to come and offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. That his blood had to be shed as an atonement for all. As the blood covers our sins. Jesus came to earth the first time for one purpose. That was to die. To be a sacrifice. But he's going to return a second time. He's going at that time to take the throne of David. To establish his earthly kingdom. And every nation and every knee will bow to him as Lord and Savior. And proclaim that he is Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, we do pray that. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Father, we see the things unfolding around us in the world. We see your kingdom being built as more and more people come to you, perhaps not in our country, but in other countries. We see the intense persecution of the enemy against the church. And Father, we say, and we look and we say, we know your coming is soon. And we pray, Father, we would be working while the day is alive, for we know the night is coming, and we can't work anymore. Father, give us the common sense to be able to pursue your kingdom and your ways, to live righteously, Father, to share the gospel, the good news, that, Father, there was, there is a Savior who died for our sins, whose blood can pay for our sins, and we need simply to accept that by faith. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaker, who is in those?